Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dennis Donut. And I'm Tracy McCray. You know, when you're suffering with an ailment, we all hope that a trip to the doctor is going to provide some kind of an easy, quick diagnosis and then a treatment plan, but that's just not always the case. Sometimes the diagnosis of a puzzling condition can be elusive, even for years, and it can leave patients and their families really desperate for answers. In 2008, the National Institutes of Health established the Undiagnosed Disease Program, and that program has grown into an international network to collaborate and share data on rare diseases in the hopes of solving more unexplained medical cases. Here to discuss is the clinical director of the National Institutes of Health Undiagnosed Diseases Program, Dr. William Gall. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Gall. It's a pleasure to meet you. And it's great to be here. Start us off with maybe just the simplest of definitions here. How do you uh, describe what would constitute a rare disease? Well, in 1983, there was the Orphan Drug Act uh, offered by Congress, and it was approved. And it defined an orphan disease as one that affects fewer than 200,000 individuals in the United States. There are different definitions in different countries and different continents around the world. But that's the one that we have and we stand by legally. But people can consider some things rare, too. I mean, something like that's one in a thousand people might consider rare as well. Very good. So those diseases that aren't going to get a lot of attention for, say, from, say, a big pharmaceutical company that might profit from finding a solution. Exactly. And that's really an an issue. Now, many of the large pharmaceutical companies companies have in the past issued the opportunity to pursue rare diseases. But first of all, the large pharmaceutical companies are changing because they realize that some of the rare diseases will reveal pathways and biochemical mechanisms and druggable targets that could be applicable to common diseases. Uh And in addition to that, there are a number of niche or pharmaceutical companies that have grown up specifically for the purpose of studying rare diseases and treating them with new pharmaceuticals. So there's some hope, and all of this was really engendered by the ability to find these new diseases, their mechanisms, and the genes that cause them. You know, I have heard uh, on occasion different stories about the effect that technology has on this, meaning that social media, some of these patients are finding themselves because they go out and they start Googling their symptoms they can't find, their doctor can't help them find, and so they set up a support group for somebody who has these types of symptoms undiagnosed, and when researchers can get paired up with that population of people, wonderful things can happen. That's true. Advocacy groups are incredibly helpful for met, uh, physicians as well as for scientists. And um, we're thinking of how difficult it is to express yourself or have uh, privacy concerns about your disorder. Patients who have really rare diseases, when they've looked and looked for a cause and haven't found it, are incredibly willing and anxious to tell their stories on television, radio, newspaper, and, and they do. They use social media for this, and when they find other individuals, that's enormously helpful for scientists and biomedical researchers to find other cases and to determine What is part of the disease and what's not part of the disease? That really is the purview of experts in rare diseases, and essentially we need more of them. Is there a condition, uh, a disease, where you can think of and give an example that that actually has been the case, that social media has helped? Well, uh, the classic case is um, one that um, Matt might developed, and you could actually Google Matt Mm -hmm. Might. Uh, He's actually a consultant to us in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, and his child has a disease called NGLY1 deficiency, and that is a problem with sugar uh, handling, but not the classic glucose handling. It's actually uh, the sugars that modify or or decorate our proteins, Mm -hmm. and there's a problem in that pathway, and his uh, son was the first one to have this disorder. But when he found out that, and he found it out actually by next generation sequencing, you know, that is, you know, gene studies, Mm -hmm. um, when he found that out, he put his case on social media. And within months, there were a handful of individuals who uh, were diagnosed with this. And now there are over 50 individuals. So this is now an advocacy group for a very, very rare disease. And it's basically because Matt might use social media 
to find other cases. Impressive. Tell us uh, more directly about the um, work that's being done at the NIH with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, if you would. Sure. We started in the year 2008 with very little money. Actually, we started with $280,000 to hire three people, et cetera. And then it was advertised and it sort of grew and people had to continue it because it had too much popularity. But the two goals of this were to help patients who don't have a diagnosis to reach a diagnosis. And usually those folks had chronic diseases and had been to many, many different places. And also to find out new things about medicine and physiology and cell biology and biochemistry, all those things that will uh, help us to advance uh, our armamentarium for uh, combating diseases. And uh, after a couple of years, we gathered more support from the NIH and saw more patients. And then in the year 2013, the NIH decided to expand this to the country and actually put out a significant amount of money to have six other centers besides the one in Bethesda, Maryland, to have clinics for undiagnosed disease patients along with support, in other words, a sequencing center, two sequencing centers, one for exomes, one for genomes, a metabolomics core, a model organisms core, a coordinating center. And so it is now a national network that just had its second course of funding through the year 2022. And Mayo Clinic has one of those undiagnosed diseases uh, programs. How do you interact with Mayo Clinic or with any of the other ones? So there are actually two spheres of interaction. I mean, first of all, there's the undiagnosed disease network that the NIH funded, and then there are independent undiagnosed disease programs, and Mayo Clinic is one of those independent uh, organizations. They Basically, they funded themselves, and they were actually doing undiagnosed diseases probably in, in a way before we were mm -hmm. at the NIH. So we share some of the um, sequencing results, some of the DNA results, to find second cases, because it's always good when you have a unique case to find a second uh, case. And we share best practices. And uh, some of the individuals who work on undiagnosed diseases here at the Mayo Clinic also come to our international meetings. We have an undiagnosed disease network international. And in fact, uh, Eric Klee, for example, uh, here at the Mayo Clinic, Eric is the chair of the membership committee of the Undiagnosed Disease Network International, and uh, they come to our meetings in other countries. So, so we have very close ties to Mayo. One final question. So you have all of these minds then in a network across the nation, and they're funneling the information and the clues and the insights that they get kind of back to you so that you can pick out the commonality and then zero in on the disease. Is that pretty fair? <clears throat> Well, it's not exactly to me. It's to the coordinating center. Okay. And the coordinating center has a database that's accessible to all the members of the network so that there's, um, they're funneling information to each other in, I see. in a way. And if you have shared information like that, you can often find commonalities. And those commonalities are not just in diagnosis. They can be in, in treatment or presentations and in, uh, let's say, putting advocacy groups together. Okay. And the final 30 seconds, what is it that you love about what you do, the work that you do? You know, there are, <clears throat> there are different things in life. I mean, and for someone who is a scientist and has a physician, there's discovery. But discovery is only one aspect of it. That's an academic or a sort of an intellectual aspect of it. But the human aspect of this is much more important and much more compelling when we see patients whom we can give a diagnosis to, even if it's a bad diagnosis, they're so relieved to have something to hang on to. And they tell us that, and sometimes they even hug us. Sounds like a pretty good day. It's a good job. <laughs> We've been talking about rare and undiagnosed diseases with Dr. William Gall. Dr. Gall is a clinical director. Dr. Gall is the clinical director of the Undiagnosed Disease Program at the National Institutes of Health. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Gall. Thank you very much.